Hello everyone, this is Mr. Miller, and today's lesson is on metabolic pathways. What is metabolism? If you recall, we talked about all cells having a metabolism, and we talked about it being all of the chemical reactions that go on in an organism that involve getting and using energy. So that's basically every chemical reaction in our body. The tie-in to enzymes is that enzymes catalyze most of these reactions. So we have several thousand different enzymes in the cells of our body. So what is a metabolic pathway? A pathway is a series of enzyme-catalyzed reactions in which the product of one reaction becomes the substrate for another. And it's kind of like an assembly line of reactions where you can think of the enzymes like the workers in the assembly line and they keep passing the products down the line until a final product is built. So why do cells need metabolic pathways instead of just a few enzymes here and there? The main reason? Enzymes are only capable of making small changes to a molecule. They can break a bond, they can make a bond. But larger changes where several bonds are broken or made are going to require more than one step. So let's take a look at a generic example of how a metabolic pathway works. It might make a little bit more sense. Let's say you have in your food some molecule, we'll call it A, it could be amino acid or something like that, you've eaten your food. So this is what we're going to call an initial substrate. Forgive my writing here. It's what the cell has taken in that it can begin with. But let's say the product we'd really like to make is way down here, this letter D here. So we're going to call this the end product of the pathway. It's what the cell is really after. I will learn to write with this pen someday. <laughs> Hope you can read that. It says end product. Now, in order for this chemical A over here to be converted to D, several things have to occur. There's too many jobs to have being done for one enzyme to do it. So on this arrow I'm going to write E1, which stands for the first enzyme in the pathway. And that enzyme uses A as a substrate and converts A into chemical B, which we just call an intermediate molecule because the cell's not really after that. But then a second enzyme, call it enzyme 2, uses B as a substrate and converts it into the product C. Whereas, I think you get the idea, then enzyme 3, three will, use, and will use C as a substrate and convert it to D. So really, a metabolic pathway, as we said, is a pathway in which the product of the first reaction, the first enzyme, is B, and it becomes the substrate for enzyme 2. Enzyme 2's product, C, becomes the substrate for enzyme 3, which can finally produce end product D, and yay, the cell's very happy. Now, some pathways are linear. The purpose is to convert A, that was a nutrient, into D and that's what the cell needs and uses. But sometimes we have a cyclic pathway in which this, say, D is converted to E by an enzyme, and that's converted to F and G, and now two different enzymes may work on G. One enzyme may convert it into this molecule, we'll call it H. A different enzyme may convert it into I, which can be also reconverted back into E, so the cycle can continue. And we'll see examples of that in the Krebs cycle uh, when we get to cellular respiration. Now another way to look at this, let's see if you can get this. Xase is an enzyme. What's the product of Xase? Okay, that would be Y. Now there's another enzyme called Yase. What is the substrate for Yase? It's 
right? It would also be y. So y is both the product of xa's and the substrate of ya's. And the goal is to make product z. Now let's look at a real example, one that you heard about in the video you watched last. Albinism or phenylketonuria. Okay, here's a very short pathway. Phenylalanine is an amino acid that we get in our diet. Tyrosine is another amino acid we get in our diet, but phenylalanine can be converted into tyrosine by this enzyme, which I'm going to not we're going to write the whole thing, but the enzyme is called phenylalanine hydroxylase. And in essence, what this enzyme does is it takes phenylalanine and it adds on to it a bond to a hydroxyl group, which is an O bonded to an H. And that simple bonding of the hydroxyl group makes tyrosine. Once you have the amino acid tyrosine now, a different enzyme over here can convert tyrosine into melanin. And that one, since tyrosine is the substrate, is called tyrosine. A's, better known as tyrosinase. Now, we're going to take a look at what happens here. If we block, I'm going to put an X on this one. If we block tyrosinase, how does that happen? Well, genes code for enzymes, and suppose the gene for tyrosinase in this person is faulty, and they can't produce functional enzyme tyrosinase. If that's the case, this enzyme pathway is blocked right here, Melanin can't be produced, tyrosine builds up, but the lack of melanin means this person has albinism. They're albino. On the other hand, if you have a different genetic disorder, which means the gene for phenylalanine hydroxylase is damaged, mutated in some sense, and you've inherited that, then the pathway is blocked here. And in this example, you think, well, also you won't make melanin. But as it turns out, since we eat tyrosine in our diet, you'll still make the melanin. But phenylalanine can't be converted to tyrosine. If phenylalanine builds up in your body, it can cause definite uh, problems and defects in the brain development. This, I just wanted to show you, is the actual metabolic pathway. There's quite a bit more involved. Here's phenylalanine right here. Here's tyrosine. There's the melanin pigments right here, and there's other products involved. If we kind of broke it down and just look at this part right here, again, phenylalanine hydroxylase converts phenylalanine to tyrosine. So if we block it right here, we know we've got albinism. And if the genetic block means this enzyme is missing, then you have phenylketonuria, also known as PKU. Okay, if you flip the page over, um, on your notes, you'll see that uh, enzymes can be inhibited, which basically means stopped. So enzyme inhibition means to block an enzyme from working. Enzymes can be inhibited two different ways. A competitive inhibitor, like this one right here, I'll label it I, it looks enough like the substrate that it will fit in the active side of an enzyme. But it's not the substrate, so no reaction occurs. What it does do is block the substrate from bonding. So penicillin, as you learned, is an enzyme, or excuse me, is an inhibitor to an enzyme found in bacteria. The reason it works, if this enzyme is found in bacteria and not in people, and we give you a lot of this inhibitor called penicillin, then most of the time the enzymes in the bacteria will be blocked by this inhibitor and the substrate they need to stay alive won't bind there and therefore we can kill the bacteria. So enzyme inhibition is one way to really damage cells, in this case for a good reason. Now a second type of inhibition is called non-competitive inhibition and here we simply have a substrate binding to an enzyme in a lock and key fashion and when it binds the substrate split in two, so that looks like a decomposition reaction. However, and you can write this down, a non-competitive inhibitor binds to some site other than the active site. So look at this blue molecule. It's binding here to a site, not the active site, 
and when it does bind, it causes the active site's shape to change, and therefore the substrate can no longer bind. So, competitive inhibitors compete with the substrate for the active site. Non-competitive inhibitors bind to another site. Great example. Everybody knows mercury and lead can cause poisoning. Cyanide is also a chemical that can cause poisoning. Each of these bind to a crucial enzyme in our body, and it binds permanently to a site that's not the active site, and yet it pretty much denatures that enzyme and keeps it from act being active. Now, one type of non-competitive inhibition that's probably the most common is called allosteric inhibition. Allosteric inhibition is a type of inhibition where the inhibitor molecule binds to a location that's not the active site, but it's a specific location called the allosteric site here, right there. So there's the active site of the enzyme, there's the allosteric site. Not every enzyme has this, but many do. Let's say this red molecule is the inhibitor. You can just see it binding and changing shape of the active site, which is non-competitive inhibition. Now, what does that have to do with feedback inhibition? Before you write anything, just take a look here. Let's say we have a pathway with an initial substrate. Enzyme 1 converts it to intermediate A, which is the substrate for enzyme 2, etc., until we produce the end product. Now, how does a cell know when to stop making end product, or will they just keep on making it forever? The answer is, sometimes the end product acts as an inhibitor to usually its first enzyme, but some enzyme in the, its pathway. So we say that the end product will feed back and bind to an enzyme in its pathway, in this case enzyme 1, and if this pathway gets blocked, well then that particular pathway is shut down temporarily, and the end product won't be produced for a while. So it helps to maintain homeostasis. Let's take a look at an example of feedback inhibition in action, and then we'll take some notes. Many of the enzyme-catalyzed reactions that occur in a cell, such as those involved in the biosynthesis of an amino acid, are carried out in a specific sequence called a biochemical pathway. In such pathways, the product of one reaction becomes the substrate for the next reaction. If the end product of a pathway, such as an amino acid, becomes available in the environment, it is unnecessary and wasteful for the cells to continue to produce the product. Cells therefore have the ability to shut down a pathway when it is not needed. In feedback inhibition, the end product of the pathway reacts with the first enzyme that is unique to the pathway. The reaction occurs at a site on the enzyme that is different from the active site, called the allosteric site. When the product binds to the allosteric site, the enzyme undergoes a conformational change and can no longer react with its substrate. There is no substrate for subsequent steps in the pathway, and the final product is no longer synthesized. Now, the interesting thing is when this enzyme is inhibited here, it's only temporarily inhibited. The more end product you make, the more likely it is for that end product to bind to the allosteric site of enzyme 1, denature it so it can't work anymore, but the binding is temporary. And as soon as this disengages, the enzyme goes right back to its active shape and continue working on its substrate and the pathway is open again. So the beauty of this is it's a great way to maintain homeostasis with respect to the amount of end product you produce. The more end product you make, you don't need it for a while, the more likely it is these enzymes, one, will be shut down. Feedback inhibition is when the end product of the pathway acts as an allosteric inhibitor, and it feeds back, if you will, to inhibit an enzyme in its own pathway. Why? The reason is the cell can avoid wasting energy by making end product endlessly when it already has plenty around, and it can maintain homeostasis with respect to the amount of that end product. So it's a way for a cell to keep a balanced amount in there. That's it for today, and I hope this helps. See you.